Good, so we're just at the start and we can now see how Linux is used in the system context. And what we did with Elisa then also, we look into this Linux and try to figure out what are Linux components? What are features which can be evaluated for safety? And then when you are looking into this feature set, you also need to make sure that uh, you identify the gaps maybe which are in there and that there's more work to do. And we will see what kind of gaps could be in there for Linux specifically, but maybe also for any other commercial operating system or a real-time operating system which you use. So for this, let's take a look into certain challenges. If you think about Linux and safety critical system, you can see all the benefits which Linux brings from the traditional ecosystem. You have a very large possibility of using Linux. There's a lot of devices out there and you already know there's a bunch of security feature how to harden your Linux kernel and also your Linux surrounding. This is something which can give you a large benefit because recently more and more products get connected and so get the safety products connected. And then if we see the large computing base, we have a good multi-core support, multi-level caches, large amount of caches, memory can be handled, and it basically runs on almost every hardware. And the last, another thing very nice to see is that we have experts and that we really have an exchange so we can go to maintainers and have a wide set of community to discuss issues, to discuss things, to have, get an exchange. But there are a few capabilities which are not yet fully in the Linux part. So if we look into a safety critical traditional OS, there is typically it comes with a hard real-time capabilities. You can always argue what means hard real-time. There are the preempt RT patches in the Linux kernel, so you get more real-time, but still it's uh, not in the, maybe in the microsecond range or whatever you consider. And so there's something which the traditional artists claim. And they have been developed with safety in mind and with a safety compliant development process. This is actually one of the large challenges which you have. So even if you say that you have good concepts, it's quite often the first question is, but have you developed it according to a certain process? So we are now up to challenge these differences and see what can we change about it. And we're a large group already now. We have a good set of members within the Lisa project. We recently have the Boeing joint. So uh, they formed the aerospace work group. I'm not cannot say too much about it yet because it's just in the starting phase. But if you may be from aerospace, uh, maybe you can even start then and join. So that would be a nice thing. Uh, we have, of course, Red Hat, Toyota, Intel, BMW group, which are all strong in there, and a large set of general members where a lot of workforce also comes from. You can see from the associate members that we also work with the automotive grade Linux. We use also the demo, we'll see this later. And we also have industry support. Here we can see the CIP project, for example, which also support us in the field. They say you can be part of our safety pass. Uh, you also have the OZADL in there mentioned. This is a smaller group that was the Silto Linux MP project, which exists in the OZADL before. And that's where we are going now in there. So you, if you are, want to learn more about Linux, get about the history of Linux and safety, you can also read some of the white papers from Mozadl and you see the base from where we kicked off in May 2019. But it's also important to understand that we, even if we work on a path forward, we cannot solve all the problems for those who are building the product. So what we cannot guarantee is when you use whatever we are doing, that your system is safe. This is still the responsibility of the person who creates the final system and we are not doing it. We are enabling Linux, but we are not creating a safe Linux, which you just download and you just have it safe. It's also not easily possible. And then if you take the things we're doing, we can also not make sure that you use the described processes and methodology because this is also still in your responsibility. The third point, which is very interesting, and I guess is becoming more and more important, is that at the point in time where we would create an out of tree kernel version and say, here is now our kernel version, we will maintain it forever. 
we cannot do this because there will be updates either for security reasons, for certain features, functionality, hardware support. So you need to move forward and this would always mean a recertification. So therefore, keep in mind, if you have an upstream first, mainline first approach, this will be something very important to challenge also because the traditional product development also for the Artos was fire and forget. Basically, you did a safe system. It's safe. There is no update. There is nothing needed in there. So at the point of production, you safely ignore whatever comes later on. And this does not work anymore for all systems, for Linux-based system and also for Artos-based system or traditional safety support. Right. And in the end, of course, you also still remain uh, responsible for the legal obligation, the liability, and so on. But we can bring a large step forward. It just means we need to collaborate with the industry. We need to collaborate with partners, with authorities. And for this, we created a mission. The mission as such focuses on elements, process, and tools, and this should be amenable to safety certification. So a lot of work is done on software, documentation. We check how the development workflow can look like and how uh, later operation and adoption of the project can, can be done in the company. So if we see, we tackle this in the work groups and the deliverables which the work groups provide are, as said, mainly elements software. I would say everything which is related to Linux in the product. So this is a large set of the elements. And to create your artifacts of the Linux, you need to have a good process description. So you need to see that the open source development process fits to a good set also to what you have in your company. And maybe you have a separate process, you follow the Veeam model. So all these kind of things, which the ISO may demand. And we need to find equivalents and show that it's at least as good as you know it already did to me. Then um, you will make use of a lot of tools because the better tool support you have, the better you come into the continuous integration, continuous certification parts. You have support for testing, for analysis. So tools is a crucial element. And all these things, if you start new on a project, need to be documented. I guess a lot of you have tried out things and figured out if the documentation would be better, it would get much forward. We're doing this in the work groups as set. We have currently eight work groups. There are vertical work groups which look into use cases so the main party of this presentation is the automotive use cases group but we also have the medical they work on an open aps system it's an automatic pedigree system and for diabetes type 1 so here it's an open source project which was created in the without a uh, safety standard or a medical safety standard but found an open source community and we're doing a lot of analysis in there and try to figure out what could be involved in there, tracing workloads and so on. And the aerospace basically takes care, just found it taking care of everything which flies. I think this was the base description. And these ideas and demands requirements, which we have from the use cases, go into the different cross collaboration work groups. So the open source engineering process basically are uh, checks which approaches can be used. They guide us a lot on the system theoretic process analyses and help us to understand what we are doing. Based on this, the safety architecture work group looks into specific elements of the kernel. They try to understand subsystem involvement on based on a use get bus more on a general case that you can later on use it for other applications as well. And the Linux features, they are looking into things, if you know security parts, you may use C groups, namespaces, and so on. They're typical inventory access control, the typical elements which you know I'm doing this to make my system secure. If I ask you the same question for uh, safety, it's not yet established. And it will also not be enough to just use this methodology, as we said on the other slide, but it will add certain elements. The systems work group then tries to combine these and bring this into a reference system, which is downloadable, running in a CI, and being experienced with it. It also goes on a wider scope, integrating more domains so that the architecture which you're drawing is looking more like real products. Tools investigation and code improvement, they 
started hosting our server where CI runs, they host tools like Code Checker, Syscaller, and so on. And all these things then get documented either as source code to the rule in GitHub, or we do certain blog posts to promote the work. We write white paper, put things on the Google Drive, which is all publicly available and linked from the different work groups. And by this, we come into Elisa deliverables. And yeah, going back to the four different topics, not every work group is working as active in the, as the others. So what you can see that there are many work groups which focus on the elements and software, but as the process is more generic, the main driver is the OSEP, the Open Source Engineering Process Work Group, and they also collaborate very actively with the uh, medical devices work group. Tools are also coming from more directions. So tools are getting created here and there because you find something handy, you find something useful and shareable. So this goes in there. And then all, of course, every work group works in documentation. You miss the aerospace in here. It's basically because they just have been formed and start to write things. To give you some examples on what is in there, we have, uh, for example, the Meta Eliza layer. This is the layer for the AGL demo. Uh, we have STPA analysis information. So STPA stands for System Theoretic Process Analysis. And this is the uh, methodology from the, mainly driven by the MIT, and it helps you to structure very large and complex systems. And it's much easier if you know what the HARA from the ISO 26262, which is the Hazard Analysis Risk Assessment or FMEAs. This gives a more graphical structured view. And it's very helpful if you don't know all the system elements by detail yet. So there it can be an additional part and it can be easily incorporated into your um, development process as an additional element. Some tools are uh, well, we use existing tools like Code Checker and run it against the kernel or another existing tool set is for kernel tracing. And we, or especially the medical device, wrote a longer white paper on how you can use different trace tools like Perf uh, to figure out how a workload is used in a system which subsystems are called within the Linux kernel. And um, yeah, something completely new was a call tree tool. This was developed in architecture work. They figured out they need to understand which subsystem of the kernel goes into which other area, who is calling which next system. And this is then ended up in a call tree. It's also on our GitHub. And I said, all the things which we're doing are getting documented. If you look into these different parts in the work groups, they also contribute to a system. Uh, we have also a mini summit on Wednesday. So you get much more information there. If you not have yet registered, take a chance to register. It's a uh, $10 cost, but I guess it's worth the money. And yeah, what we can see of this is we work in the systems work, for example, on a larger set where we try to build up a system which involves also an RTOS hypervisor because it looks much more like, you know, from software defined vehicle, maybe from other industrial architectures. So it's actually also driven by an industrial use case, real world use case, and we now enhance the things. And by this, the use cases contribute to the Linux activities. The architecture brings in things to clean up your parts. Features could get into the Linux and, um, Tool investigation, code improvement goes into multiple folds, items. Yeah, and the engineering process is surrounding around everything so that we common have a common element and you find things. Yeah. In this, just to mention, uh, we also collaborating with different other open source projects in the safety critical space. So there's Sixan project where we regular meet with. We have the Sapphire integrated in there because they all provide a safety pass. And depending on your use case, this may be also a good thing to look at. And as uh, George Bernard Shaw has said, if you have an apple and another one has an apple, if you exchange the apple, both have still one apple. But if we exchange ideas, you have an idea, I have an idea, then at the end we come up with two ideas. And this said also on the wider scope, um, we work together already a long time since the beginning with the automotive grade Linux. We see that there is now the Eclipse SDV movement and there's a Sophie from ARM 
and we see a lot of automotive players in there, so we also reach out to them. A little bit more on the importance, just to <laughs> pre-note, so there will be the keynote from Kate. Tomorrow she's talking also on how the different ecosystem parts are needed, how security getting more important, how safety plays a role in there, what it means to IoT. So this just said on this. And finally, we come to the details of our use cases. We have a dashboard use case within the Elisa Automotive Workgroup. So you know most likely the instrument cluster quite well. And if you own a car and if you have an old car, your instrument cluster may be based on LEDs. It turned over into uh, digital signs. Maybe this is the first step from software-defined vehicle, right? Because the software defines what's happening next. And this could mean there is more responsibility to the operating system. And as you want to centralize your traditional instrument cluster, maybe with your infotainment hat unit, similar like the AGL guys also bring demos together these days, you see that more and more software involvement, and you may ask the question, isn't this something which I can purely base on Linux? And this was also our idea. You know, the main thing was that we want to use it to derive safety requirements. We're quite convinced that these safety requirements are very similar also to other use cases because the medical may serve the similar demands and also industrial areas and more complex use cases like others. Um, What's interesting about this telltale is, I can tell you it's about this warning sign, this check engine sign, the gear thing, and you directly understand. And this makes it quite good to draw a system architecture and also to explain to us so we don't need too much time on this. Another nice thing is that we can start without the real-time kernel extensions because it would add a certain level of complexity, but we don't need it yet because we can still operate with a watchdog mechanism and say we have 100 milliseconds, 200 milliseconds until something should be shown. Right. And yeah, how we have done this, we have recently ported our instrument cluster demo to Needlefish. You see this mark there with a danger sign. This is something where we created the signal source control list. And by this, you can corrupt a message which coming via CAN, you can uh, also trigger a safe state, which basically would trigger to reset and reboot the system. And this is something which we did it on Qt or Qt because we started our work on Koi. At this time there was Qt, so we are not yet on Flutter, I guess that's the new thing, but uh, I'm pretty sure from the underlying, if we go down to the kernel and the interaction with the GPU, we end up at a very similar state. I'm not the Flutter expert, so if someone wants to correct me, please feel free. And for now, we will also stick to the Qt. We may go over to Flutter over the time, but we have, from the resources, we're looking for volunteers to go to Flutter, but for our analysis, it would work out. And this is basically how we start the activity. We came up with a demo and we wanted, if we figured out we need to understand more. So we were using STPA and start to draw a system context. The system context basically eliminates the usage of Linux. It's more on a generic operation system it goes for control actions and saying what could be an unsafe action from one element to the other. And what we see, there's yeah, a crucial element of an external watchdog. This is the EGAS approach. It's a traditional safety approach. It's not the nicest new thing, but still a very common one. And um, we also go into deeper analysis. So then it looks like this. Nobody can read this. So uh, it was basically just to show it. And the main elements are still always there. There's a driver, a sensor, actuator, uh, the watchdog mechanism. And here, this is also just part of the system. So therefore we need the wider system context. Right, and if we bring this on another level, you can still draw the same architecture and see that if you just change some elements, you can uh, say um, you have always a non-safety related part if you maybe have a camera part, think about a rear view camera, park distance control, surround view, um, then you have non-safety parts, but you also have safety related things which may come from a camera. You combine them in your system again, and you take then a display to output, maybe what you have to see from the rear view camera or surround view. And in this triggering the workload, you have more demands, most likely on real time capability because you don't want to be half an second delayed when your camera gets on, right? So you can 
extend certain functionality to this. Um, also park distance control is a use case. If you take this, there is the beep and you know all this when you start parking, but um, then it's suddenly an audio interaction, no longer display, but the elements see that if the audio really played, is the audio properly? Is there a distortion in there? Does it arrive? It's very similar to the concept of a telltale where you also just look into, in the end, there's certain memory region in which a telltale should show up. And is it correct? So you check a memory region against another and you need to make sure that it happens in a certain amount of time. And this is a repeating pattern which you have in a lot of fields. So um, what we are going on for the next part is uh, we have an outlook. So one thing which was figured out after we have done this long analysis, we now would like to get more people getting attraction and we see that you need to have an entry point. Much more about this will be in the uh, mini summit. So I have a few slides of slides. Well, yeah, quite a bunch of slides on this on Wednesday. Um, we're doing this together currently, the setup of the CI, which also was a shared state with cache builds so that you don't have to do the whole building process, or you can just start with using images. And this is in support with the, and collaboration with the tools investigation work group. Then we also figured out that if I show you these diagrams, and if I especially show you the more detailed diagram, uh, you need to really have a documentation about the components. So we first start with the unsafe control actions, which is just from one module to the other. And whenever someone new joins, the same questions come up again. What does this mean? Because a word doesn't describe the function all in there. Therefore, we figure we need to enhance this. And along with this, if we have a monitoring app included, a safety monitor, which we have written, uh, we wanted to have a quick start. We dived into a lot of architectural analysis. And now after one and a half years, if we look again into the original source code, we miss the full documentation of it. So we will enhance this in the safety monitoring part and also see that where we have currently a lot of mockups and just hook in to show the basics, we will go into more telltale checking mechanisms that you compare display content. Originally, we uh, didn't look into the checking mechanism as such, because depending on which hardware you use, you will later on use a much different comparison mechanism. There's hardware with, which has directly display comparison integrated as a module, which may not be always uh, open source IP. Um, you may start being very creative and use artificial intelligence with it, or you simply go into frame buffer or loopbacks and so on. And by this we said, don't concentrate first, but now is the time to look into it make it better because we really go into the kernel level. And in order to go into the kernel level, we use the work which was done by the medical devices. I mentioned that in the beginning that they want to understand how the workload looks like. They had the implementation, they had a lot of documentation at hand, and they could go into the SDP analysis, into details, and figure out which subsystems are involved. And so for this part, we will now start using the different uh, workload tracing mechanisms to also see which subsystems are involved in our demo of the instrument cluster. Right, and this comes closer to an end. So you can see the evolution of the whole thing is that even if we start with a telltale use case, which is not this fancy autonomous driving thing which everybody wants to do these days, and it's not the full-fledged software-defined vehicle, it brings you down to a basic use case which is there to derive your requirements, get your system understanding, and you will need all this to later on increase the use cases. And if you come with a large architecture which involves hypervisors, which has the RTOS, um, which has multiple sensors, multiple actuators, you need to understand all this and see their interference, what could go wrong, what will they do together. And this is all limited to the base with the Telta use case. And then you can say, okay, I add something in here. I start to increase the complexity with maybe a more fancy watchdog mechanism, or I put in real-time capabilities, which will be a large step. I involve camera processing additionally for my graphics. And this is a stepwise approach. So don't try to win the race 
with looking at the uh, full autonomous driving vehicle, which will be the nice use case in the end. But go a stepwise approach brings you much better insights. And I hope that when we have done our analysis and you can see what elements from the kernel are used, how different timings are involved with, like you have rendering at different timing than um, checking. And then also the GPU has a different timing than display has. So by these different interactions, we will all see the complexity, how workloads and processes communicate in the Linux system because it's not all straightforward in there. And then on the long run, you may end up also with an autonomous driving use case. And now I see the lot of promotions which have been done a year or two back. They're saying it's always coming in waves that people say there's a full autonomous vehicle in another five years, but somehow it's making also this little step. Nobody starts with a level five. You start with level one, level two, level three, level four, level five. So by this, I would like to conclude on what I had to say. As I said, there's much more in the mini summit on Wednesday. Uh, we have a dedicated hour, full hour on the automotive part and another hour about the systems interactions to bring these two things together. And you also get general insights into ELISA. If you don't want to wait until Wednesday, there's also a large getting involved knowledge base. The links are already in there. I uploaded the slides to scat.com, so you have already access to it. Uh, and you can see all these hyperlinks and check out, reach out to me. And I guess now it would be a good time for you to ask questions, if there are any. So I want to ask you about uh, how you place uh, Linux testing because uh, I am a part of the Zen project at this point. Yeah. In the Zen project, we try to make the mainline Zen as a safety compiler, but the Linux must use it as a must use the file. Yeah. So it's not realistic. So, so there may be two ways. One is uh, taking one specific version and staying the code and then add some extra code to make it a safety critical compiler. But another way might be the even a partial to try to make the mainline Linux as a safety compiler. So what yeah. is the reason to Mm -hmm. So the question is basically that uh, in the Xen projects, there's a mainline approach and it's, uh, it's a much smaller code base and you already have a lot of effort within the Xen project to do this maintenance and how are we in Elisa approaching it. So we will go continuously with a mainline approach also. We know there's a large change in code base and this does not work with the traditional approaches of a safety certification. So what we do in there is, on the one hand, we look into continuous certification. There's the one part that you can really distinguish or, or can see, I have an automated flow, I can certify again. For this, you need to increase a large set of test sets and the tools around it. And you can also see what the architecture work group does. They split into safety related and non-safety related features. So they do a lot of analysis work and say, these components are safe, they have no interference with my safety related part. And when the change comes in there, I have less analysis to do compared to a safety relevant part. Um, additionally, we have a lot of set of pre-existing software, which is not there in the uh, traditional ISO 26262 standard. So there are certain components where you can make use of it, of complex, more complex software product, but the large set is currently also a way to work with authorities and uh, get into interaction to make more use of pre-existing parts. Not to say proven in use, it's not what we want to do, but to handle a larger set of software. And uh, there another part also to get a little bit forward on this is uh, some argumentation to have multiple instances of the operating system and being arguable to reduce certain safety level on this. But this is just the new upcoming thing, also the Automotive driving does a lot and they actually come up and say we want to have these differences in operating system uh, to benefit from it. So not having the main line, but the main approaches work on the processes, find safety related, non safety related elements in there, reduce the kernel size configuration where you can reduce the packages which you use. Uh, I guess Red Hat is saying, for example, they have the standard Linux, which has 4000 packages. They reduce it to 400 packages, strip down certain parts and yeah, work with us with the authorities to go on the next version of the ISO to also include elements, making your life easier there. Thank you. Thank you.
Yes, yes, they are consistent. So in this uh, this uh, developed uh, on the APL system or other system. You mean the, the APL, uh, APL. yeah. So we have the AGL cluster demo as the one part. You're asking if the demo is based on AGL and yeah. Um, we base the demo on the AGL cluster demo as such. And for the wider system, which we have with the Xen and the Artos part in there, in the reference system there, we are migrating from RT Linux to the AGL one. But currently we have really Needlefish based instrument cluster demo. And we take the sources, add our Meta Eliza layer, strip down here and there, and then build the complete thing. So it's really based on the AGL Needlefish. Sorry. Yes. I wonder uh, if Elvita is planning to uh, have an AP set data so uh, they can uh, compare the link. If so, uh, what is the coverage of this only in kernel or uh, have more coverage? Mm -hmm. Yeah, the question is if there is a plan for for Lisa to do certification on certain elements and what the overall strategy on this is. So we see that our partners which are involved as companies, they are doing their part in there. They start certification of Linux kernel elements, they start certification and qualification of tools. And within ELISA we support this, but ELISA as such, we're not planning to do the certification that we come up at a day with a certified Linux kernel or something like this or a subset of it. Uh, this is done within the member companies. They work on this and their output of it, what they've done, goes into what we are uh, using. So you will experience things, you can make use of it, but we're not doing it on our own. Yeah, for the questions on about which company is doing certi safety certification, uh, we some part is that we have UL as member, they are doing safety certification as such and they are supporting us in our work. But you see from the companies which have an interest in Linux, there is a code thing. They are actively contributing and they even qualified certain tools. There is an old uh, webinar on this also, an old talk from one of the Elisa workshop. You can search for Rafia approach. There you can see the certification pass. And the second strong to, not, to name it is also Red Hat. They working also together with Exedar. Exedar is also having good influence on the ISO 26262. And they are working then in collaboration also with General Motors. General Motors is not the member, but this, this in this three year round of three, they are doing a lot set of uh, certification work. Yeah. Right. Okay. Tim. So the question is, thick.o kernel, there's a runtime verification element in there? I'm not sure, actually. We haven't done that yet, right? Okay. Yeah. Do you want to do a webinar? I don't know. Do you want to do a webinar? I don't know. I can give a few slides. Okay. <laughs> what, what we have done in the past was looking also into eBPF elements, for example. So eBPF was used or other mechanisms, but no. Also, we're not on 6.0. Kernel yet we'll see AGL demo. Okay, one minute left. So there would be chance for a last question. If there are no questions, there are some stickers and some uh, blinking lights for Lisa Brandit. So before you leave, and if you have interest, grab one if you like. And yeah, I'm there the next days. Either come on Wednesday or see you around and then. Just ask questions whenever they pop up. Thank you so much.